Today we are studying It is dark, but I'm not dormant. It is dark, but I'm not dormant. Shall we pray? Lord, I pray that you will stir us to action. You will help us to see what is clearest and nearest, and you will help us do with firm hand that which you've placed within access. Speak to us in our dark seasons. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Turn with me to Genesis 8. Moses, in describing the account of the flood, says this in verse 4, or should I say from verse 4. And the boat of the ark rested on the tops of the mountains of Ararat. That is how it, 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 it finishes. Then verse 5, it says, and the waters, it says, in verse 4, it says, on the, on the seventh, in the seventh month, on the, on the seventeenth day, did the boat rest upon the tops of the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually. And on the tenth month, on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains visible. And Noah opened the, and Noah waited 40, after 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent forth a raven which went to and fro continually until the waters were dried from the face of the earth. He also sent out a dove to see if the waters had abated from the face of the ground. Skip with me and read verse 13. And it came to pass in the 601st year, on the first month in the first day, where the waters abated from the ground, and Noah opened the coverings of the ark. Having laid the scripture foundation, I want to invite you to think through some things with me. You, you, you probably are now a bit more troubled. I realize most people imagine that the flood was just a 40-day event and Noah was out, but you begin realizing this guy was in here for a year, a whole year. In Genesis 7, verse, verse 5 and 6, he enters in his 600th year. In Genesis um, 8, verse 13, he is opening the roof, the coverings, in his 601st year. That's, that's a whole year of being in that, in that space. I do hope he didn't have claustrophobia, the fear of closed spaces. And at times, that's how long our dark experiences go. They don't just go for 40 days, they go for some time. The different faces, when you, when, you, when you read Genesis 8, at least you are aware that there's a face where the rain stops. Or to use English, the rain stops beating us. You also realize there's a face in this dark experience where it's windy, very strong winds. You realize there's a face of settling. You know, a boat resting on the top of a mountain is not a gentle experience. There's a shaking that is happening. And then there's the noise from outside as the waters are, are going. And did I mention the stench? Remember, outside there is this huge mass of organic matter that is dead. And that does not smell very pleasant. You actually need to thank God for the wind because it serves almost as air conditioning. Otherwise, if things were very still, that filth would just come in, filling into the boat. Anyway, all this to suffice to say one thing. The one year the Noah is in the darkness of the experience of the ark was not similar it was darkness with different flavors or with different stages. You know what I'm saying. You know that the 
experience you're going through now is not homogenous. It's not just been one continuous thing. It has had certain faces. The struggle or the dark face in your family has had a financial angle and then there's been a teenage rebellion angle and then there has been a job insecurity angle and different faces, different tastes within the entire thing we call darkness. But the million dollar question is how did Noah respond in his dark situation and what can you and I learn from his response about our dark situations? The Bible, when Moses indicates, he writes that when the boat had rested on the tops of the mounts of Ararat, Noah does two things, not at once, but in steps. Step number one, he will go to the window and he will open the window and do a few things. That's from verse 6, continuing. And then after the window face is done, in verse 13, he goes ahead and opens the roof. Before we dive in more to know what that means and how we apply it, one thing is clear. Actually, I should say two things are clear. Thing number one that is clear is Noah was not seated in the corner of the ark pitying himself through the entire dark season. The Bible does not give us the picture of a 600 year old man whining in some corner through the dark situation or gathering the seven other members of his family to have pity on him because of the dark situation they were going through. Noah does not do that. He is not dormant. He is not docile. Noah's period of waiting in the ark is characterized with activity and with action. In the Christian teaching, we do recognize that there will be periods of waiting and we are cognizant that there will be experiences that are dark. But for the Christian, led by Jesus himself on the night he was in Gethsemane about to go through the mockery of a trial that will end up with him dying. In his own words he tells the disciples come watch with me. He knows the inevitable. He's in a literal dark situation but Jesus is not going to take it down sleeping. He's going to have some activity. In this case the activity selected for Jesus was prayer. It is not the biblical teaching that his children should go through their dark spaces of waiting while docile. Granted there may be a change in activity, there may be a reduction in activity, there might be a suspension of some activities, but the Christian teaching is not one of sitting in a corner and brooding about our situation. The second thing that you notice is what Noah does not do. You can learn a lot by what people do, but you can also learn quite an amount by what they don't do. Noah does not swing to two extremes when the boat is rested. Extreme number one, he does not presumptuously exit the boat to try and figure out things outside of the boat on his own. He does not prematurely imagine that now that the rain has stopped, he can venture outside of the boat and figure things on his own. That would be both dangerous as it would be presumptuous. But also on the other side, as already mentioned, Noah does not sit passively by in the boat as if there is nothing near and clear that he can do. He does not operate on these two extremes. There is a balanced middle point he goes through. It is dark, but I am not dormant. What does Noah do? Number one, he will go to the window. And number two, he will open the roof. Let's unpack this now. When Noah goes to the window, remember, the boat has rested on the top of a mountain. It's no longer rotating by the waves. It's, it's stable. It reminds me of a song that says, And when my heart is overwhelmed, please lead me to the rock 
that is higher than I. It gives me stability. It might not eliminate all the things that are happening, but it gives me stability in the middle of the storm. So, so, so the ship is rested on a rock. And remember, the ship has a window at the top level. And Noah steps to the window to look outside. Now I need to, 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 to guide us on this. Noah is human, so there's only so far he can see. But what is he seeing? Remember, the winds are blowing, the waters are receding, and all that is the work of God. By coming to the window, Noah is given a front row opportunity to begin observing what God is doing. Naturally, that should encourage him that he is not abandoned. That there's a God who's kept him in the safety of the restrictions of the ark while on the outside the same God is at work doing things which although initially Noah may not have been preview to them, now he is. The window therefore represents two things. The first thing it represents is it is the place of revelation. And by revelation, I mean Noah is given the opportunity to be revealed what God is doing on behalf of him, his family, and the occupants of the ark, in this case, animals. By opening the window, that which had initially been concealed to his sight as a man is made plain to him. May I underscore this? The Bible reminds us through the words of Peter that we have a more sure word of prophecy which shines like a light in the darkness until the day dawns and the morning star is revealed. We do well to leverage on prophecy. One thing we should do in our dark situations, friends, is position ourselves at the point of revelation. Let me be very clear so that I'm not ambiguous. I'm not saying when you're going through your dark situations, only read the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Those are revelations. You should be able to study them. But God reveals his will through his word and in the arena of prayer. In fact, somebody described and aptly so that prayer sensitizes the soul to the direction God is moving and allows the individual to align with God's agenda and God's direction in their life. If Noah spent time seated and brooding in the ark, he would not have had the privilege of standing at the window and looking at what God was doing and allowing him to begin to align with God's agenda. The window, a place of revelation, the place that allows us to be able to see what God is doing. Now, the water is not dried up in a day. Certainly, the winds continue to blow for some time. But Noah, every day he comes to the window, can begin seeing the little, almost imperceptible changes in the terrain. He can see the water levels decreasing. He can see the mountains emerging more clearly. He can see the debris that is floating decreasing. He can be able to begin seeing the water becoming clearer. He can see water reducing and more land beginning to emerge. It may happen slowly. But it is only possible because he's spending time at the window. Friends, there are things we are praying for. There are dark nights we are going through. But the more we brood over our situations, we deny ourselves that which we can get through the arena of prayer and the clarity we can obtain through study. These two things combined reveal God's will to us. Even in our dark situations, we need to be acquainted with God. As a songwriter says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless we pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. But then, as already intimated, Noah is human. He can only see so far. He is human. He cannot swim through the mess that is there. And so, listen to me good, Noah turns to what he has within his reach. 
Let me digress for a minute to make this clearer. In that ark was an elephant, at least two of them. In that ark was the lion, or at least two of them. In that ark was a giraffe. In that ark was a leopard and a cheetah with their speed. But friends, the task outside did not need strength. The task outside was not adjusted to speed. The task outside needed flight. And so Noah bypasses all these huge animals and goes for two otherwise smaller ones, a raven and a dove. Let me speak a bit to my church leaders in the house. In the changing terrains outside there, have we become good at selecting the right talent set to lead us into new terrains? My theologian friends, I often at times fear we are guilty of usurping more than we are equipped for. Theology is a powerful thing, but it is not the only thing. I'm worried about pastors working themselves too much and taking upon themselves too much because they've not recognized the ravens and the doves in their congregation that may do a better job of leading us into certain terrains by Noah reaching out to other things. It is him admitting that for this terrain, I am ill-equipped. I need somebody. I need other people who are way better than me at this. It is only last year that one of neglected department called communication got the preeminence. Normally they are tucked somewhere at the back of a church in rooms that have barely any room to wriggle within and equipment all over the place. But when the pandemic closed our churches, we were all scrambling, looking for that boy who we castigate because he comes to church without a tie. Now they were the leaders in the new terrain of taking us online. We need to become smart at understanding what terrain is changing and who's the raven to send out, who's the dove to reach out for. But then Noah's leveraging of the raven and the dove allowed him to be able to see further than his eyes could be. It allowed him to investigate way wider than his human capabilities could. Every day as the raven went out and came back in, and every mission the dove went out and came back with, came true to that word which says, the best way to know how the road ahead looks like is to ask people who are coming back from that place. It would do well many young people who are seeking to enjoin their eternal interest to other people in the institution of marriage as they step out from the darkness of singlehood into the promised light of marriage. It would do them well to reach out to some old raven and some old doves and ask them what's true with marriage. Too many marriages are ending up unhappy because many did not do the work they needed to do at the window. They didn't spend time getting revelation from God about their spouse-to-be, and they did not spend enough time with men and women of experience to tell them the reality about marriage. They were educated by the radio shows and some flimsy blogs, and they thought themselves equipped, and to their shock when they stepped into the new terrain called marriage, they were ill-equipped for it. It need not be that way. If we look around carefully in any situation, you want to begin saving for your retirement because you do not want to continue in the financial darkness you've been in, please reach out to some Christian brother who understands money. You want to launch out into a business because you want to step out from the darkness of financial uncertainty. Please reach out to a brother or a sister who understands the terrain of business. You want to grow in your faith because you felt it's been stagnant for so long? Please reach out to a brother and a sister who's mature in the things of faith. It is in God's divine order that he has surrounded us with ravens and with doves. Because at the window, besides it being a place of revelation, the window is also a place of research. God will never do for the human being 
what he has placed within human power to do for himself. God does not work that way. He opens the Red Sea, but then asks the human beings to walk, for he's given them the capacity to walk. He rains down manna, but he requests that human hands collect that manna and prepare it into a meal. He, 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 he will come to raise Lazarus, but he will first request that human hands should roll away the stone, and then God will do what humans can't do. He will raise Lazarus from the dead. And when Lazarus is finally awake, he will command that human hands to untie him because human beings can do that. It is not in the divine order for God to do for the human subject what he has placed within human power to do. So because human beings, even in their dark situations, can research, can reach out to others who know better about what's coming ahead than they, God will ask us to do that for ourselves while simultaneously depending on him through prayer and through study. It is dark, but I am not dormant. I am at the window getting revelation from God, and I am at the window researching. Now, I'm skipping material, and we will come back to this before the end of this series, after Noah has sent forth first the raven, which, and, and, and you don't notice, the raven's work was different from the dove's work. The raven's work was going back and forth. The raven is a, is, a, is a bird of prey. So Noah is observing the raven to know how much dead material do we still have. As long as the raven is going to and fro, Noah knows there's still a lot of dead things. That's why the raven is going back and forth. But then the dove is not a bird of prey. He sends it out to observe completely different things. How is the plant material going out there? You notice the mixing and the variability. And when Noah is done observing them, eventually the dove comes with a fresh olive in its beak. Noah knows it's dry and plants are growing. And then now he's able to do phase number two. Listen, child of God. As much as we pray, we need to work. Faith must be combined with work. That's a divine order. Noah does not just spend time at the window observing what God is doing and glorifying him. That builds his faith. But then he turns to the ark and takes the animals to do the work. Faith that works is the way the children of God are saved. Is the way the children of God are being perfected for society with the angels sometime soon. Show me your faith. Without works, and I will show you my faith through my works, said James. And he made that unequivocal statement, and he said, faith without works is dead. But you see, because of the research phase that is done very well, Noah is able to do the next phase. After realizing, hey, waters here have dried up, Noah does step number two. He removes the coverings of the ark. You've almost now realized Noah is in this space for long. But why does he do this? Remember, the ark is made with first floor and second floor. The animals, for all intents and purposes, were largely in darkness. But animals need light for many reasons. But a key reason animals need light is because it makes them prepared to reproduce. Any person who keeps chicken knows what I'm saying, that if you just keep playing with the light cycles, you can be able to adjust how your hen lays eggs. Animals use the cycles of light and darkness to be able to calibrate their reproductive cycle. So light is an important thing in helping them produce the requisite hormones and apparatus that will be able to make sure they can be productive. Now, the animals have been locked in, which makes them very restless, and then they've been in darkness, which diminishes a lot of their capacity to reproduce. But God knows what's coming ahead. Is changing the terrain, and this new terrain will need to be filled through reproduction. A, 
Because Noah has spent time observing the direction God is going, he knows what to do. And so way before the command comes to tell him, leave the ark and go out and be productive, Noah opens the roof so that light can enter into the ark and by light entering more and more into the ark, the animals can begin being prepared for reproduction when the night season is done. You notice, this would not have happened if he first had not spent time at the window. And notice, even after he spent time at the window, this work of removing the roof could not be done for him. He did it himself. My friends, yeah, I know the season now is dark, but it is also a time of opportunity. Yes, I know, Brokenness has slowed you down, but it's an opportunity to study. Yes, I know the demotion has made you not travel as much, but it is time for you to pour your life more into your family who had missed your presence. And by so doing, you prepare them to become productive for the kingdom of God going forward. Yes, I know it is a dark season but I'm sure if you look around enough at the gifts and the opportunities that God has given you, and if you look at the gifts and opportunities God is calling you to, this dark season needs not be spent in dormant whining. There's something you can begin doing to sharpen those skills, to enhance that ability, to enrich that community, so that finally that door of opportunity that you are praying for, when it finally opens, it finds you ready. Ready because you spent the night season not just crying and whinging and whining, but you spent it exposing yourself to the relevant lights that can be able to enhance your reproductive ability. When you will sit before the panel, they will not want to hear how you've been bypassed for the promotion time and time again. They will want to hear that while I spent this period doing less duties, I took some time off to study and increase my worth for this company. While you are young man, while you are still single, the lady does not want to hear how you are busy whinging and whining about your singlehood. He wa she wants to hear about how you are studying to become a better man. How you are putting aside money because you knew not when God will give you a bride to be, but you wanted to be ready when that bride came along. That's an attractive man. Lady, when you are single, the man wants to hear and say that, no, while I was still waiting for God to bring you, I was not focused on my nails and my hair. I was putting something between my ears and I'm coming to the table with something way more than a pretty face and a shapely body. They say chance favors the prepared. We serve a God of preparation. He is so audaciously prepared that he can reveal it in advance. And if we are made in this image of a prepared God, it is a scandal of no small proportion that God's children walk through their dark seasons doing nothing like their father. And they end up missing out on opportunities or being subpar when opportunities appear because they were not prepared. It is dark, yes, but that darkness is a time of preparation. It was dark in Genesis when God prepared the work for creation. It was dark in Gethsemane when Jesus prepared to go to the cross. It was dark in the night when Peter, realizing his sin, made the work of preparation to lead and went and fell down and cried for the Lord to take him back after denial. It is dark, yes, but we can expose ourselves to the lights of study, to the light of scripture, to the light of training, to the light of mentorship, to the light of coaching that increases our productive ability. It is dark, but the child of God does not need to be dormant. They will need to do three hours. They will need to expose themselves to revelation. They will need to engage in research. 
they will need to get ahead with increasing their capacity to reproduce. And when we do this, through the night, through the storm, we can sing because it is night, but we are not dormant. Lord, there are things you have placed near and clear to us. But often we have focused on the darkness around that on the things that are near and clear. And because of our focus on darkness, the darkness has amplified. But loving God tonight, today, you remind us that even in the darkness, you give us sufficient light through the window of revelation. I pray, Lord, the altar of prayer and the table of study will not be vacated. But loving Father, even in the dark season, help us be acquainted with you. And Lord, move us beyond the theory of revelation and let that revelation we get move us to action. Father, there are people you've put around us. There are abilities you've put in us, which even in the dark season, you want us to leverage on them to research on what's coming next or on what we can do. And combined with our obedience to revelation, we can be able to navigate the darkness with hope. Help us have the humility to access these people. Yes, at times, Lord, by accessing them, it is an admission that we need help. But loving Father, grant us that humility that we will get the right help for the right terrain. And Lord, you don't want your children seated and whining. You want them to prepare to reproduce. For everything that you hold and you control grows and gives. I pray the Lord going forward, you may hold us, you may control us so that we will grow and we will give. And that Father, whatever our hands find to do, we'll do it faithfully even in the night season. If that includes exposing it to areas, to learning, to mentors that will allow it to be able to be increased in its value or reproductive ability, help us do so. Through the night, through the storm, drag us from the corners we want to sit and whine. Remove us from the pity parties we have created for ourselves. Take us to the window. Reveal yourself to us. Reveal what's coming next to us. And then take us to the roof to remove the limitation of a roof. Allow your lights to enter into our lives and prepare us for a life of production. It is dark, Lord, but let us not be dormant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.